Support for this episode comes from Omnipod. It used to be that you would have to choose between an automated insulin delivery system and the freedom of a tubeless device. Now, with Omnipod 5, you can have the best of both worlds all in one. Omnipod 5 adapts with every pod change to meet your unique insulin needs and adjusts insulin using a customized target glucose, not a range. If you're ready to ditch the multiple daily injections or send your tubed pump packing, there's never been a better time. They'll even check your insurance coverage for you. Fill out the quick online form, see if you're eligible for a free trial. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Omnipod logo. For full safety risk information and free trial terms and conditions, visit omnipod.com slash diabetes connections. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, Disney very recently made some changes to their Disability Access Service Program, often referred to as a DAS Pass, at Disney World and Disneyland. We're going to talk about why this happened, what it means for you, and what else is going on at the parks. We're also spending some time talking about a new service for doctors called Glucose Path, which helps them pick through all of the combinations of diabetes medications for their patients, and about a new surprising study about cortisol and diabetes. I'll also explain how these two guests can talk about all these very different issues. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. Welcome to another week of the show. You know I'm always so glad to have you here. I'm Stacey Sims, and we aim to educate and inspire about diabetes with a focus on people who use insulin. I have a new show, Diabetes Connections Type 2, which is aimed at people who have diabetes but perhaps don't infuse or inject insulin. I'm really excited about that show. Please tell your friends with prediabetes or type 2 to check it out. This is one of the few episodes that will actually be on both feeds because, as I'll explain in a minute, there's a lot of overlap here. Real quick, just got to mention that Mom's Night Out events for this fall are both open for registration. We will be in Denver in September. We will be in Philadelphia, just outside of Philly, in October. And I'm hoping to let you know where we're going in 2025. We're doing probably four more next year. This is bananas, but it's just great how it's caught on. So please register for Mom's Night Out or go to diabetes-connections.com. Click on the Mom's Night Out tab to learn more about this event for moms of kids with diabetes. All right, so a lot of moms have this concern, I know, because a lot of you reached out to me, when it was announced that Disney was changing their DAS Pass. I saw a lot of panic in some diabetes groups. This is a resource that many people rely on. I've been very public about my family's experience with this pass. I wrote about it in my World's Worst Diabetes Mom book series. I'm going to come back and talk about it after the interview. I know you want the information here, and my guests this week are great resources about Disney and about diabetes, which is an interesting pairing, but it'll make sense when I explain it. Len Testa is the co-host of the fabulous Disney Dish podcast and the creator of Touring Plans, the app and service of the unofficial guides to Walt Disney World, Disneyland, and the Disney Cruise Line. Testa is all about the math of theme parks. His guides are there to maximize the magic, as he says, to make your weights shorter and save money. And it's all based on calculations from his team. Now, Len teamed up with endocrinologist Dr. Bradley Eilerman a few years ago to create Glucose Path, which uses computer science and clinical data to evaluate every possible treatment option using data from the patient, the FDA, and peer-reviewed journals in just a few seconds. Dr. Eilerman also talks about the Catalyst study, which looks at people with type 2 diabetes and measures cortisol. It's a big deal, and the results were very surprising. I'm willing to bet this will ultimately have ramifications for people with type 1 as well. I will let him explain it. Len Testa, Dr. Bradley Eilerman, right after this. Most people who take insulin have experienced low blood sugar. It can be disorienting and scary. Very low blood sugar is very scary. And that's where Gvoc Hypopen comes in. Gvoc Hypopen is a ready-to-use rescue pen for treating very low blood sugar in people with diabetes ages 2 and above. If you take insulin or sulfonylureas, you are at risk for your blood sugar going too low. Low blood sugar emergencies can happen unexpectedly and they demand quick action. You need a safety net when it matters most. Be ready to treat very low blood sugar with Gvoke Hypopen. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Gvoke logo. Gvoke shouldn't be used if you have a tumor in the gland on top of your kidneys called pheochromocytoma or if you have a tumor in your pancreas called insulinoma. 
Visit GivoGlucagon.com slash risk for safety information. Lentesta, Brad Eilerman, thank you so much for joining me. Welcome back to Diabetes Connections, although it's been a while. I'm glad to have you back. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, you got it. Lots of concerns in the community over the changes to what's called the DAS Pass at Disney. So before we talk about anything else, let's jump in and talk about these changes. Len, let me start with you. Maybe set up what it is supposed to do in the first place. Sure. So uh, everyone knows when you go to a theme park, um, one of the things that you're going to encounter is long lines. And so Disney wants to be as accommodative to guests as they can be. And they have this program called the Disability Access System, which allows guests who meet certain criteria to use a faster line, a shorter line, to get on some of its more popular rides versus standing in line for three hours like the rest of us. And so that program has been uh, around for decades in one form or another. But Disney recently announced a set of changes to that based on uh, some patterns of behavior that they were seeing in the parks that maybe wasn't uh, what the program was intended for. Before we jump into the changes, I recall, I mean, my son's 19, and I think Mm -hmm. we first took him to Disney when he was four. But it was different back then, right? Wasn't it more of a front of line pass and it has changed to something else even before this change? Right. It's gone through a couple of iterations. Um, uh, More than a decade ago, it was called the Guest Assistance Card or the GAC, which I think is what you might have had. Yeah. Um, Uh, Now it's called Disability Access Program. Basically, it's the the same intent. Uh, The mechanics of it are slightly different around how you go about qualifying for this accommodation and then how you're using the parks. But fundamentally, the idea is shorter lines for people who need it. How do you use it now? What does it do? So the way that uh, the way you use it right now is uh, you'll set up a video chat uh, 30 days before you show up in the parks, and you'll talk to a qualified healthcare professional who says uh, who asks you how your condition prevents you from waiting in line. So there are a couple of important things there. Um, right off the bat, they don't ask you what specific medical problem you have. They may or may not be allowed to ask that based on the Americans with Disabilities Act, but Disney generally is, is trying not to ask those questions if they don't need to. And then if you uh, if you qualify, uh, you get a pass, and it's a virtual pass, so it's on your phone, um, that allows you to walk up to an attraction that you want to ride, talk to a cast member, an employee who's running the ride, uh, and they'll set up a time for you to come back. And uh, when you come back to ride the ride, you get in the shorter line. Uh, so it, uh, it really saves a ton of time for people who, uh, who need legitimate accommodation. The, uh, the downside to it, the thing that's been happening is to get the same service if you don't have a disability can cost up to 38 or $39 per person per day. So there's a strong incentive for cheating, Stacey. Yeah. And unfortunately, the numbers that I've heard and the, the things that we've counted in the parks uh, lead me to believe that there's, there was a lot of abuse going on. So Disney's had to add additional restrictions to the program starting May 20th in Orlando and then starting in June in California. Brad, let me bring you in, Dr. Heilerman. Somebody with diabetes, and this really differs person to person. We talk about this a lot because my son, we never asked for the accommodations. I can totally understand why someone would want them. Absolutely. But I don't have experience with it, which is why I say it that way. I'm sure everyone listening would kind of get this, but why would somebody need them, right? You know, talking about high blood sugar in the sun, maybe somebody who's newer, whose kid was just recently diagnosed. Sure. Um, I think that the heat by far is the the biggest concern. Um, I was in Orlando in the parks in August um, of 23, and the heat index was, I believe, 106. And even as someone who doesn't have diabetes, it was hard to stay outside for more than about 20 minutes at a time. Uh, When you take into consideration skin perfusion with regard to things like insulin pumps or even a subcutaneous injection, and then the thing that I would worry about the most is denaturing insulin. Uh, If you're wearing Mm -hmm. an insulin pump, it's sitting in a tube, and um, at those temperatures, I can't guarantee that the insulin's going to maintain its full efficacy. So, so that's my by far largest concern. And in in light of the fact that it seems like it's getting warmer and warmer and warmer um, and warmer for longer. Um, I think that's a a place, particularly for outside queues, where it's going to be a big barrier. I think the other thought, of course, is, you know, being able to access food in in case of a low. So uh, a mutual friend of Len and I, we were um, at the parks about a year and a half ago, and we were getting ready to get on the Guardians of the Galaxy ride. And before we got on, he handed me a bag of fruit snacks and he said, do you have an accessible pocket? Do you mind carrying this? I was like, sure. 
And I, I was kind of wondering why. I'm like, if you don't mind me asking, I'm like, this is a pretty short ride. Are you are you trending low? He goes, no, but what if it gets stuck? I'm like, that is smart. Um, valid point. Valid point. Yeah. So he he was thinking ahead and was was really on top of things uh, to the point where I thought I was going to be this uh, this resource during the trip, but he he had it all down. <laughs> but you know, of course, like you mentioned, with a new diagnosis, you're not necessarily going to have somebody that's thinking that far ahead. So you know, you have two down arrows on your Dexcom, and you're halfway through the rise of the resistance queue. What are you going to do? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I've been there. I have crazy stories where we, oh my gosh, we got stuck on the mummy in Universal, me and my son. And really? I was like, what's your blood sugar? How are you? And of course, I'm the Sherpa. So I have, I mean, I could have yeah. fed the whole cart, you know, for a week, <laughs> but I've drilled <laughs> into him, you know, right here, throw him. Yeah, you're throwing packets of gummies like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sir. Yeah, it's, it's for, it well, was we, for my son. <laughs> we've also talked about what happens if you're on a roller coaster. We live near Carowinds. Oh, yeah. And, you know, what happens if you are without me and you're on a, a uh, roller coaster and, and you get stuck, you know? So, you know, we've gone through, I mean, it's not the best thing to do, but I'm always like, if you're worried about going low, take your insulin, disconnect your insulin pump, you know, or suspend it or whatever. But there's all sorts of tips and tricks, but that doesn't, I'm laughing because I could just do a whole show on disasters at, at theme parks. Maybe I'll do that another time. But for this pass, mm-hmm. what about family, right? Isn't there a group thing, a group situation, as I recall from the previous iteration of this? Yeah, one of the things that um, that uh, the pass allows you to do is bring family members with you. And, you know, it's a theme park, it's a family vacation. You want to be able to bring on the ride with you the people that you came with, right? So Disney's also changing the rules around that a little bit. So the current policy until May 20th is you can bring up to six people with you, any six people you know. After May 20th in, in Orlando, it'll be the greater of um, four people or your immediate family. And uh, Disney hasn't actually said yet how they're defining immediate family. My understanding of it is it's basically anybody on your family tree that you have a direct connection to without going through someone else. So your parents, your siblings, your children, and your spouse. Len, they're not going to be checking for like a birth certificate or a family tree. I mean, how are they? I guess they didn't, I, I don't know. That's a tough one to enforce. Well, so it's four people or your immediate family. Yeah. So, I mean, they could ask for ID, right? And yeah. then that gets a little complicated, but then they can look at addresses and yeah. on the IDs. And yeah, I know. It's, They're not going to want to do that. No, no, no. And I think, I think some of this is like, you know, we're going to tell you what the rules are. We may not enforce them on every single person, but the penalties, if you lie, are severe. So you, uh, you get kicked out of the parks. You, uh, you're trespassed, which means you can't come back. You forfeit basically every dollar that you've spent to get there. So they kick you out of your hotel. Oh they get rid of your t- yeah, it's, they're not fooling around. And that tells you the amount of abuse that's been going on on it, that they're saying these consequences are what's going to happen. And they're giving everyone fair warning on it. So, wow. Well, and I like the way you phrase that because the folks that are nervous in the diabetes community are people who need this and aren't going to abuse this. You know, I heard from so many people initially who said this, you know, the bad, bad actors are ruining it for us. Yes. But it doesn't sound like they are. It sounds like you can still get what you need if you go through the proper channels. I'm, I'm being, am I being too hopeful? I mean, Disney's said that they're really trying to target a single digit percentage of the population who have developmental disabilities who need accommodation. That's the core for this service. And I think everything else after that is going to be on a case by case basis. The good news is, is they've outsourced some of this interview process to a healthcare third party, where if you actually need to talk to like a registered nurse or a psychologist, um, one will be available to you for that. So if you can make a reasonable case for why, so like, you know, Brad's point about, uh, you know, denaturing insulin, if you stand in a long line, if that's your concern, I would absolutely talk about that specific thing, especially if you're going during the the couple months of the year. And I mean, by that 10, um, where it's really hot in Florida. (laughs) If you're going there the 10 months of the year where it's hot in uh, Florida, that, yeah, that would be a concern. Yeah. So uh, before we move on, I already mentioned Universal and I know you heard talking to talk about Disney, but is there a similar program at Universal Orlando? There is. It's run by a different um, third party company, but the, um, the, the setup is essentially the same. It's there to uh, make sure that the people who need uh, the service uh, get the service. And I think that's, the, uh, that's the, the big message on it. It's not that you know, the theme parks are trying to make it harder for anyone. The level of abuse of this of this system is so great that it can't continue the way it is. Yeah. And then the problem is, is like the people who actually need accommodation are actually waiting longer than they should because of all of the abuse that's going on. And that's the the problem that needs to be solved first. Right. But bottom line, it sounds like do yeah. this in advance. Yeah, wait. do it 30 days in advance. Yeah. As, as soon as in advance, you can do it. Go ahead and do it and get it done. 
All right. Excellent. And we'll wait and see what happens when they do change it over. You know, we'll start hearing reports and stuff like that. All right. You guys have lots of stuff that you're working on, though, beyond Disney. Although I am going to see you in Orlando, I guess, for ADA. Dr. Eilerman, let me start with you. What's up? What are you guys working on? Right back to the interview. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Edge Park. Life is busy and managing diabetes is a daily, sometimes hourly commitment. Well, Edge Park can help you say goodbye to the worry of managing your diabetes supplies with a variety of cutting-edge insulin delivery systems from brands like Medtronic and Tandem. Plus, Edge Park accepts most insurance plans and handles the paperwork so you can simplify your life, your diabetes care, and your budget in one click. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Edge Park logo. So Len and I um, continue to work on um, the glucose path software. So just as a, a catch up um, for people who may not be familiar. So Len and I developed software that helps select um, appropriate medicines for people with type 2 diabetes, um, taking into account um, their medical issues, how easy it is to take the regimen. We take cost into account and we've studied it. We can demonstrate that it improves hemoglobin A1C. We had a, a project that we ran right up to the pandemic um, at my healthcare system. Um, and we lowered A1Z by um, 2.1. Wow. Yeah, 2.1 yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, we did it in a way that reduced medical claims. So we uh, we did more and cost less. We're building on that project now. Um, I took on a role in my system where I help operate risk contracts for insurance companies. So what a risk contract essentially looks like is um, given a population, we are aiming for really what we should be aiming for, which is well patients who are not getting sick. So you take on the risk of um, healthcare costs in exchange for reward if people um, are not spending money. Um, And so really it's a wellness focus that benefits everyone involved. But in order to do that, you have to distribute sometimes expensive resources to the people that really need it. So we've decided that um, this would be a good opportunity to run a project again. So Len and I are in the early stages of building something that will be oriented more towards Medicare, which will um, be a, a different group of people. And some of the nature of the way that drugs are priced in Medicare makes this a, a special group. Is glucose path something that doctors are using? Uh, where is it in the chain? Interesting uh, you ask <laughs> that. So we've gone through a lot of learning through uh, the whole process of developing it along the way. And, and while it remains a tool that can be used at the bedside, what we're finding is that it gets utilized best when we're looking at large groups of people. What we did during the the project that we had with Kentucky Medicaid just before the pandemic is we actually had pharmacist partners running the software and then providing the recommendations to the primary care doctors who then decided to either accept them or reject them. Um, They accepted them in the vast majority of cases and then the changes were made. And so there we're respecting the time of the patient and the provider, but at the same time, we're we're doing that deep data dive that gives the ultimate, hopefully best choice. We hear so much about semiglutides now and GLP-1s. And are are those configured in this oh, yeah. project or no? Yeah. So um, one of the interesting things that the software does is that it evaluates every possible combination of drugs and doses that you could provide at the same time. Like for a for a typical patient, you might we might be examining two to five million viable combinations. The thing that I tell people all the time is that computers are great at number crunching, and we shouldn't ask physicians to solve what is essentially a number crunching problem, right? So Doctors are very, very smart, right? No doubt about that. But I doubt that any primary care physician, I doubt that very many of them could even name all the different drugs available and their doses, let alone consider their efficacy, know about cost, know about um, contraindications and things like that, right? That's memorization of things like that is not what people are good at, but computers are great at it. So that's that's the advantage of the software. It basically leaves no stone unturned when it comes to uh, to examining options. So when a new one is, a new drug is approved, you throw it right in. I have so a yeah. well, process. Uh, uh, like, yeah. well, right. So we built it in based on the clinical trial data that brought it to market. But a great example of this, have you ever heard of um, a drug called bexagliflozin? Or I have oh, yes. see? <laughs> so, Bresnavi is the brand name. Yeah. 
So it is an SGLT2 inhibitor, so similar to Jardian's Farsiga and the like. Um, it was approved a little over a year ago. My uh, system was one of the sites for their cardiovascular trial. So we, we followed this drug, we brought it along, it did well in the trial, we saw it got approved, and then we didn't hear much of anything about it. I had a patient ask me if I had heard of it before. I'm like, yes, I, I actually did. Um, I was an investigator in the clinical trial program. I'm like, why do you ask? And he goes, well, I heard you, you can get it for less than $50. And I, I, I'm like, okay. And I typed it into the electronic medical record and I saw I could prescribe it, but I didn't see anything with regard to the formulary that the patient was on. So it ends up that it's really not on any formularies. They are just pricing the drug at less than $50. It's just at a limited number of pharmacies, including uh, Mark Cuban's Cost Plus Pharmacy. So they are selling it at one-tenth the price of the popular SGLT2 inhibitors. It's something that the software discovers quite easily, but unless you're hearing about that through word of mouth, you may not know that this drug even exists. This is where we hope that we can overcome barriers that are brought by, by the fact that the company is not marketing the drug. And the lack of marketing budget, I'm sure, is part of the reason why they can price it so low. Yeah, that's really amazing. Knowing that the computers are great, you can find these drugs, you can see if they work for the patient. How does the patient access this? Is that something that's in the future? Is this the idea that your, your physician would say, oh, you have type two, you have this other condition, you're already taking this medication. Let me look at Brad and Len's magic machine and we will find what's best. Well, the, the challenge with that is during our um, process where we asked for FDA review, they were very particular that this was a provider-oriented tool um, because clinical judgment needs to be applied to the recommendations. So we don't serve as a substitute for clinical judgment, but we, we serve as more, again, a number cruncher to present the choices in front of the the provider, and then they can make the decision about whether it's appropriate for their patient, which is why in all of our projects, we've included an opt-out. The providers aren't, aren't asked to force their patients into something that they don't think is appropriate. Right now, it's not oriented to be a, a patient-facing tool. No, I, and I, I may have asked that the wrong way. I guess what I meant was, can I as a patient, like my husband has type 2 diabetes, can I say to him, oh, the next time you so see your doctor, ask him to run this computer program? I mean, is it available? Or is it still oh, yeah. in the... I mean, physicians can sign up for free for it, sure. Yeah, you need to, I think you need to, to sign up, you need a, an NPI, uh, a provider number. Yeah, but that's it. Nice. And if there is a provider that has a lot of interest, one of the idiosyncrasies as far as being able to utilize it well is to have the right formularies loaded. So yeah. if there was a, a provider that was really interested in seeing a formulary that's not listed, let us know and we can yeah. do the, the due diligence to make sure that's that's loaded in. Fantastic. Yeah, so one of, one of the things we did for uh, for Brad's project for the risk contracts is basically loading up all of the formularies for all of the uh, risk contracts that are available. And thankfully, it was um, there were multiple Medicare Advantage plans we had to cover, but they all had the exact same formulary, which is nice. So tell me about the Catalyst trial. Sure. What, what are these results? So Catalyst is a trial that started just several months ago. And it was um, essentially asking the question of patients that have difficult to control type 2 diabetes, here defined as a hemoglobin A1C of 7.5 or greater on at least three non-insulin medicines, insulin and another non-insulin medicine, or two diabetes medicines and two antihypertensives. Is there something else going on, in this case, specifically looking at excess levels of the hormone cortisol? Cortisol is um, a hormone made by your adrenal gland. It's part of your stress response. And it's a lot of what drives things forward um, when you have elevated glucoses if you're experiencing a stressor. So you're having an argument or you're, you're a student going through exams. So um, you're, you're a lot living of- in 2024. Right. 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 <laughs> yes, <laughs> of course. Um, and How are we so, not all in uh, right. this? Yeah. <laughs> so cortisol is your natural steroid. The glucose response to cortisol is going to be the same as in excess levels as you would have if you had a steroid shot or a prednisone for asthma, for example. And so glucose can go quite high. This is well known in a condition known as uh, Cushing syndrome. Cushing syndrome for a long time was thought as something that certainly happens but is very rare and often caused by things like tumors of the adrenal gland or pituitary gland. 
Um, and so it's something that people thought of, but they thought of the more extreme versions of Cushing syndrome where there's a lot of physical features. So round face, weight around the abdomen, very thin arms and legs. What though has been observed in other trials, largely in Italy, is that rates of high cortisol are much, much higher than was thought previously. But these were all retrospective studies. And so for the first time, we wanted to take a large number of patients proactively and say, given this particular profile, so someone who's having a difficult time controlling their glucose, do they have abnormal amounts of cortisol? And people were guessing is what the rates were going to be. Now, right now, the rates of Cushing syndrome are quoted to be with regard to annual incidence rates, so new cases, somewhere around 40 or 50 per million, so not a lot. Yeah. And so if you ask the question, well, how often would you expect to see this in people that have some physical manifestations in terms of high glucose, but not other physical manifestations like the round face or the weight around the abdomen, more than what you would expect in the patient population of type 2 diabetes as a whole? And I thought the rate was going to be somewhere around 2 to 5%. And I thought that sounded tremendously high compared yeah. to the yeah, 50 per million. Yeah, because 50, 50 per million is, is, yeah, that's like one every 20, 20,000. Yeah. And, and yeah. again, that's the incidence, not the prevalence, yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah, still, prevalence, it, wouldn't, yeah. it wouldn't add up to a prevalence that's even yeah, 2 not to even 5%. Close. Yeah, no, you're right? way off. Yeah. So I was super interested in participating. There were some very well-known endocrinologists involved, um, a guy named Dan Einhorn's running the program, an endocrinologist named Ralph DeFranzo, who's extremely well-known in the diabetes world as an investigator. I, I've known Dan for a few years. He invited me in. I accepted very uh, excitedly. So we were guessing, and, and Dan was saying he thought it was going to be 10 to 15%. I'm like, Dan, it's not going to be that high. <laughs> 2 to 5%, though, will still be groundbreaking. In the winter, they we got about 700 patients in, and the results were so striking, they actually had to release a press release to the community because it was considered significant enough that it may impact their stock. It and the rates affects the patients. The rates were 24. <laughs> They're up there too. Sorry, sorry, yeah. we'll stop. We'll stop. No, we'll stop. <laughs> no the, the rates were 24%. 24? 24%. And it's consistent. I mean, you were only off by a factor of 10, Brad. You were close. <laughs> <laughs> so we, I was seeing it, and the other investigators were seeing it. We didn't have the pulled results. We were talking amongst ourselves like, this is insane. This is nothing what we thought it was going to be. The only reason why I can talk about this at all is because they had the press release. But those of us who were investigators were glad that we could talk at least about what was seen up until February. So they continued to compile the results. We enrolled the last few patients just a few days ago. Um, so the study is now closed. We have roughly a thousand people. We are going to be presenting the first phase of the study, which is just the prevalence data at ADA. So we're on the last day. I am so excited to see the results presented and we have more details that I think will be very compelling um, when people see them. I think what it really emphasizes is that when you are treating someone with type 2 diabetes and you're running into challenges, you really have to consider a lot of things beyond just the fact that someone may not be following a treatment plan. We fall into kind of an unfortunate paradigm where we blame patients for chronic diseases. And I tell people all the time, the most important thing that I decided to do, and I, I can tell you exactly when I made that decision, but it was to believe patients. I don't know if you ever watched the TV show House, but the mantra of House is that everyone lies. Right. And while I can see how that's a good tagline for a TV show, it's not necessarily great medicine. And I remember I was moonlighting at, at the VA as a fellow, and I was seeing a guy in the emergency room, and he came in. And he was complaining about low back pain and he was looking for some relief and, and, you know, opioids had relieved it in the past. And in my mind, I was thinking, here's some guy looking for opioids. And I got into his chart and I saw that he had just gotten back from Iraq and he had an IED that had gone off next to his vehicle and he had gotten the medical discharge. And then I, I really realized how cynical I had become through the whole process. And I decided that that's just not the way I wanted to be. It wasn't good for patients. It wasn't good for my mo own mental health. And that doesn't mean that, again, you take everything as the absolute straightforward words from a patient's mouth, but you have to assume that everybody's coming from a good place. I think type 2 diabetes especially, 
people get that diagnosis and they're so reluctant to ask for help, share anything because in their head, they're saying, I need to eat better and exercise more and this will all go away. And it's not the case. I mean, it is for some lucky people, but you know, you see these medications and the effects that they can have and they're absolutely incredible. I got to tell you, I'm not that surprised. I mean, I don't know anything about cortisol and I don't, I mean, obviously I'm far from a healthcare provider, but what I have learned in 17 years in the type one community is just how much we don't know about what diabetes does to other hormones. But knowing that it's not just about insulin in the pancreas, there's so much more going on. But then a dumb question, and I know I'm getting ahead of myself because you haven't even finished the study yet. What do you think we would do for something like that? Is this a treatment then to try to get the levels of cortisol to go down? So what we're doing in the catalyst trial is we're actually, we have a phase two, um, which is ongoing right now. And in phase two, we're introducing uh, a medication that blocks the effect of cortisol. So the levels themselves don't go down, but we prevent the cortisol from fully binding to the receptor. And so the impact on cortisol, on the glucose, and on some other um, clinically relevant factors go down. It's going to be very interesting to see if treating the underlying condition causes a substantial improvement in blood glucose. And so yeah. that will go on for um, the next several months. And then hopefully at this time next year, we may have some news about what happens when we're actually able to, to block the cortisol. That's really exciting. That's great. Yeah. All right. Before I let you go, got to circle back to Disney. We will all be in Orlando for Orlando. ADA, and then I'll be back in July for Friends for Life. Len, I haven't been to Disney in a long time. Um, I go every year to mm -hmm. Coronado Springs to go to this convention. I rarely venture in the parks. It's hot. It's a huge convention and I'm tired. What should we go to this year, though? I mean, this is July, so I guess looking ahead to see a few things are opening, right? Right. So the big attraction that, that should be open by the time ADA happens is this thing in the Magic Kingdom called Tiana's Bayou Adventure. It's uh, the story of Princess and the Frog in the old uh, ride that was known as Splash Mountain. That's the big thing. But recently, they've opened up a thrilling roller coaster called Tron Light Cycle Run, also in the Magic Kingdom. Um, and then over in Epcot, they've got two new rides, um, Guardians of the Galaxy, which is a indoor roller coaster that is supposedly the longest indoor roller coaster in the world. And also um, Remy's Ratatouille Adventure, which is a family ride uh, that takes you through the Ratatouille movie from Pixar, which is adorable. Really, really fun. I love it all. I love it. Disney Dish is such a great show, so we can get all our tips and tricks. Oh, I listen to you guys all the time. Any advice? I mean, I know people are going to go through the new disability services pass and, and use that advice, but you know, any like little thing that helps you that you might, wouldn't mind sharing? I mean, the, the big thing that I tell people um, is to have a plan, right? You, uh, the last thing you want to do is show up in, uh, at the parks, you know, walk in uh, past the turnstiles and then try and figure out what you want to do. So um, you want to get there as early as possible. You want to know which rides you absolutely must see. And if it's a popular ride, the thing is probably to go there first in the day or last, right? So that's the best general advice. And obviously, you and I could probably talk for hours oh, about we have a whole the, show. Th you don't need the three to of us can actually talk about <laughs> yeah. strategy for, for, uh, for days. But yeah, that's the basics. Uh, show up and have a plan. Yeah. Have you been, have I'm sure you've been to every single stitch and Brad, you two of, of the parks. You've been to the, the Dolly Lounge over in Coronado Springs, right? Oh yeah, it's lovely, yeah. Isn't that the nice? Dahlia Lounge, yeah. I like Coronado a lot. I like, uh, also I like uh, Barcelona, the uh, the bar in the in the basement. It's very colorful. Yes, very bar colorful. Barcelona. Yeah. Uh, but, but I wanted to ask you, because I was in there, and I can't remember what the name of it is. It's not, it's Salvador Dali, but that's not the name of the lounge. It's the Dahlia, Dahlia Lounge. Dahlia yeah. Lounge, the Dahlia Lounge. But there's another, like a Kronos Lounge, right? Isn't there like the a The Kronos Lounge is, the, it, yeah, it's, it's the- It's like um, the partner. I had a great night. The bartender and I sat and talked all night and he told me all about this, but he couldn't get me into the Kronos Lounge. So it's the um, it's the lounge for the, the concierge level of no. Kronos Springs. I think it's actually the best value, the best club level value in Walt Disney World. It's the least expensive way to get a private lounge. So, and the great thing about that is like, let's say you're bringing a, a family of, you know, four or five or six people, right? Everyone's going to have a slightly different eating schedule. So the advantage of having access to this lounge is that if a couple of kids are hungry, everyone doesn't have to schlep all the way down to a restaurant, oh. eat or not, right? So you just send the kids over to the lounge, have them grab whatever they want, and you know maybe they'll bring you back a couple of M and M's or a snack or something <laughs> too, right? Uh, or a, an apple, a healthy apple, whatever you yeah. know, whatever you decide, right? Yeah. Right. Also, <laughs> right. sounds like a great plan if, as you listen, if you're going to Friends for Life and you would like your favorite podcaster to hang out with you a little bit longer, maybe get me a pass to the. 
Chronos Lounge. Chronos we can lounge, hang out yeah. and have a good yeah. time. But I really do think it is the best uh, best uh, club level lounge in Walt Disney World. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. I will definitely be following up with both of you. Obviously, some different priorities here. But we'll talk again, hopefully, at ADA. Maybe we can get an update on this as the report comes out. I mean, this catalyst just sounds phenomenal. Um, and I, I really appreciate you keeping me in the loop with that. And, um, and I'll link up all the information about your podcast, Lynn, if people do have questions. I know you've done episodes on this um, as well. Oh, of course, of course. But thank you so much. It's great to catch up. I really appreciate you both being here. And I hope to talk to you soon. Thanks. Thank you. I'll see you soon. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. I don't think there's a better source on Disney information than Len and his team. I listen to his podcast all the time, even though it's been a long time since my kids and I have been to Disney. I mean, minus the Friends for Life conference that we go to every summer that I, I mentioned there. But I have used touring plans. And if you have any questions about that, um, I'm not I'm certainly not paid to endorse it. Um, but I'm more than happy to tell you what I like about it if you want to contact me offline and tell you about our experiences with it. But I promise to talk a little bit about the DAS Pass and our family's experience. I've shared this before, but we've never used it. And I think part of that was how it was presented to us when Benny was very small. We first went to Disney when I think he was about four years old. And going with the disability pass didn't seem like something we actually needed, but it was something that people talked about back then, and maybe they still do, as like almost a reward for having diabetes. Like these kids have it so tough, this is the least we could do. And my husband and I were really uncomfortable with that kind of thinking. You know, we didn't want special treatment for diabetes. And that's not really what that is. I mean, don't get me wrong. That, this was our thinking because of the way it had been presented to us. And it wasn't for a long time that I, I kind of turned around to seeing it as what it is, which is help if you need it, right? Accommodations for people with a legitimate disability. Because we always went kind of in the off season. And I'm a super bananas planner, thanks in part to, you know, lens resources there. We never waited in line. We never had any issues. We were very lucky. Um, I've since explained to Benny, you know, when you go to a park like this, if I'm not with you, here's how you can request a disabilities pass. Here's why you should think about doing it. But I don't think I'm alone. I think a lot of people look at it like, you know, with their noses wrinkled up, like, I don't want to reward my kid this way. Like, this doesn't feel right. And that's not what it's about at all. All right, as we are here at the end of May, oh my goodness, ADA coming up soon. Um, the big conference happening in Orlando. I'll be bringing you lots of information from there. But I'm already looking ahead to fall because as I said, Denver, Philadelphia, Mom's Night Out, open for registration. Grab those early bird specials before they are gone. Thanks as always to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here soon. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged. Like most of you, we don't love worrying about insurance. I'm thrilled to tell you that Dexcom CGM is covered as a medical benefit for 98% of commercial insurance plan holders who have type 1 diabetes. And more and more plans cover CGM for people with type 2 who use insulin. We even have it as a pharmacy benefit, so I can process it at the local pharmacy. They put it on auto refill for me, which makes it really easy. It's one less thing to think about. It's worth checking to see if that's available to you. And Dexcom will even help you do a benefits check to see what your insurance covers. It's easy. It's right on the website. Dexcom is the number one covered CGM brand. Learn more. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo.